Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher, founder of Simply Plant Based, where I have a lot of programs to help you to change your health destiny. And today I have Dr. Neil Barnard, and we're going to have some straight talk about the COVID-19 virus. So thank you so much, Dr. Barnard, for taking the time to be with me here today. Great to be back with you today. Well, I know one thing about the Barnard Medical Center. You guys are starting to do telemedicine. Can you tell me what's going on there? Yes. This is something that we were doing anyway at the beginning, although the arrival of the pandemic accelerated the transition a bit, I have to say. For many, many people, they don't need to come into your clinic because you're not necessarily listening to their heart or their lungs. You're talking with them about their lab tests, medications that they're on, their past history. And some of that does not require having the person actually in front of you. In fact, I would go so far as to say that might be 80% of people, particularly someone with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, many conditions like that. And there are a few conditions where it doesn't work very well, where you actually do have to physically examine the person. But we have uh, three physicians and a nurse practitioner and four dietitians. And so now we can see people who are either local and they don't want to come in because they're in lockdown with the virus, or they might be across the country and they would like to see us. And uh, so they're able to. We're, all, we're limited to certain states, New York, California, Massachusetts, Missouri, Maryland, Virginia, the District of Columbia. I, th I think I didn't leave any out, but so for people- well, I'll in the, post it below. Thank you. For people in those states, they can just, they just give us a call. There's an actual human being who answers the phone and says, when is a good time for you? Is there a certain practitioner you would like? And da 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 and we're more than happy to help, help people. And uh, now I have to say now it's really been a lifesaver. There are so many people who are afraid to go out and they've got an issue, they've got questions. They have questions for our doctors. In many cases, uh, it's just a medication issue or something else. They, many of them have questions for our, our dietitians also. We're happy to help with all of those things. And what's the best part? Mm -hmm. It's plant-based. Well, you won't find a doctor here who's, who asks you, where do you get your protein? Um, so, <laughs> the, um, Excellent. Excellent. Our, 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 everybody, everybody who works, works here is very familiar with how nutrition works, and they're very happy to help you. All right. Well, it's good to know, especially in this day and age. Yes. All right. Back to the basics. You know me. How, how does this virus spread? What are we talking? Uh, yeah. Well, this is a respiratory virus. So it's presumably breathed out or sneezed out or coughed out of one person's mouth or nose into the air and into yours. So you inhale it and the respiratory little droplets will persist in the air for a little, little while, but they can also persist on surfaces that you might touch. And so you touch the surface, then you touch your cheek, your nose, your mouth, whatever, and you can presumably acquire it that way as well. Right, wow. Okay, we've been hearing about the curve. <laughs> when are we going to hit the peak? Have we already done that? Are, are we past it? What's going on? We may be past it. Different research teams have been sort of placing their bets on where we are with this. And a group at the University of Washington has been watching particularly closely. They believe we're past it. They believe that the, that the peak was April 10th. Now, when I say peak, though, they weren't looking at the peak number of deaths or even the peak number of cases, what they were really looking at was the peak number of hospital beds and ventilators and ICU spots that were gonna be used because they were there to help people plan their medical care allotment. They believe we're past it as a country. Big caveat, it hits different places in a, in, in a bit of a sequence. Washington State was early, New York relatively early, California, yeah. Cal yeah, exactly. California later, Florida even maybe an inch later than that. So the country as a whole may have peaked, but if you live in Gainesville, not yet, still coming. And the other caveat that I have is just because you hit a peak does not mean it's over. Right. Um, in fact, there was a, quite a, a, a steep climb to the peak right. and, and only a very gradual decline afterwards, meaning that some people stay sick for a while, but new cases continue to come up and come up and come up and come up. And that's going to happen well into the summer. And are there, are we dealing with different strains at this point? We may be. Um, there's some suspicion that, that exactly that is happening. And there are two things that, that can happen with any kind of virus. One is the virus will just mutate a little bit. 
bit by bit. We, that's what we see with influenza. Right. Every year you got the flu coming around and it's a little bit different from the last time. And so the vaccine manufacturers try to guess what will the, will the, the this next year's virus look like. They sometimes get it right, they sometimes get it wrong. But th th those are just routine viral mutations. Coronavirus is doing that. The big and more dangerous thing is called reassortment, where you'll have the existing influenza virus, that, to use this word, gets married to another influenza virus that say came from a wild duck or whatever. Their genes get together and you get maybe five of the uh, genes from this one and three from this one, whatever. They re the genes reassort and you've got a whole new virus to which you have no immunity. And that genetic change is much more dramatic than the, the year by year mutations. My concern is this. In the same way as in 1918, the influenza H1N1 made its appearance with the so-called Spanish flu. And now every year we've, we effectively have new variants of that all the time. But in 1918, we had no immunity to it. It, it killed millions. In 2020, a coronavirus that was novel entered the human population for the first time. It's not going away. We will see it. We will see mutations of it from year to year. And if we see reassortments, hopefully we will not. If we do, they could be deadly. So, no, we, we are not done with this. We will not and, be done. Are, 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 are we, we going to see? Are we going to see waves of this coming? Yeah, down? I, I, I fear. Well, for, first of all, yes, we are very likely to see waves of the one we have now, COVID nineteen. The wave, what, the, the, what we are expecting is that people will go back to work. Right. When they, when they go back to work, there are gonna be some more minor aftershocks, so to speak, of people who get infected. And in the fall, there may be a whole new wave coming through. That's just sort of a, a political decision, an economic decision that people are making. What is much worse is the new waves that could come from mutations, where the virus is actually physically changing, or even worse, a reassortment where you have a virus that is just a whole new animal and is not like the one that we're dealing with now. It could be milder, it could be more deadly. Not to extend this too far, but it should be said that the 1918 virus came in and every year, and it killed millions, we, we acquired a certain amount of immunity to it. But in 1957, a major reassortment uh, of this virus occurred and it killed many more. And then 11 years after that, another big reassortment, and it killed many, many more. And so that's just what we're fearing. We will now have, not, not just with influenza A, we've got to live with that, but now coronavirus as well. Wow. Wow. Well, don't all infections, viral pandemics, don't they come from animals being crammed into each other, next to each other? The, the uh, influenza A virus which all of them appear to be avian viruses, meaning they come from birds. And they can start in a wild bird. A mallard duck flies over and might be carrying that virus perfectly happily with no real symptoms. But the duck settles down in a field or poops into the field where your flock of chickens are, are uh, grazing. And then the chickens are around your other flocks of chickens. Uh, so, so the accumulating birds will then become a cesspool of the viruses that, that started in a wild bird. Coronavirus, it appears to be, uh, well, there are many coronaviruses and they appear to be endemic to bats, perhaps not causing symptoms in the bats. But all you need to do is instead of leaving the bats alone, just bring them into your live animal market and put them in a cage and have them at proximity to ducks and anteaters and deer and all other animals. And you're just inviting a biological leap from the bat to another animal. And two things can happen when a virus goes from one animal to another. One is that the transmissibility of it can change, meaning that, that the one in the bat may not have infected a human being, but as it continues to pass through other species, it may in theory become more infectious to humans. The other thing that can happen is, is the dangerousness of the virus can change. It might've been fairly innocuous at first, but it can become more and more dangerous as time goes on. Well, share with me what PCRM is doing to respond to 
these animals being cramped next to each other? Okay, well, thing one is to prevent future outbreaks like this, we have to stop these live animal markets. And what I'm speaking of is the image that people have had from Wuhan, China, where there's every different animal in a different cage. People come by and they'll either acquire the live animals, put them on their, the handlebars of their bike, and go home with them because they may not have refrigeration. And they want the animal to be alive until the moment of cooking. Or the, the animal might be slaughtered on site. But what is, we need to eliminate those live markets. What people may not realize is there are live markets in the United States. In, in the city of New York, there are 80 of them or more. Um, and they cater to different populations uh, for different reasons. But it's, you, we are just inviting infectious diseases into our population. And we have already had a number of cases of infections coming from these live markets. We have uh, petitioned the U.S. Surgeon General to use some legislative authority that, that the Surgeon General does have. And most are not aware of this. But if there is a sudden arrival of a dangerous epidemic, the Surgeon General does have the power to ban certain things. And years ago, there was a case where salmonella, which, you know, as you know, salmonella can be a terrible and sometimes even deadly infection from bacteria. The Surgeon General used his authority at that time to stop the sale of what they, they discovered the source. They were in turtles that were being sold to little kids to bring into their house as, as pets. And the Surgeon General said, sorry, you can't trade in these animals anymore. They're, they're carrying salmonella. Well, we now have something many, many, many times worse and more deadly. We're asking the Surgeon General to use authority, his authority to ban live markets, whether they're in New York or anywhere else in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world. That requires his action within the U.S., but also harmonization internationally. When do you anticipate hearing about this? I don't know. We, we are pushing hard. I think the Surgeon General is, is a good, good man and a good physician. I think for now, my, my guess, if I had to guess, is that they're preoccupied with getting through the current yeah. pandemic, and they are probably not thinking very hard about the next one. But one can do both at the same time. It's, it's a relatively easy thing to yeah. ban these, these uh, markets. Well, are there scientists in the greater community calling to dismantle factory farms in the wake of this? Well, l let's say this. Every single person who's thinking about it realizes that the failure to close one business led to the closing of effectively every other business. So everybody realizes we have to, we have to close down these markets. But then it, it raises the question, well, going beyond the live markets where the live animals are, are there, are the object of sale, what about these enormous factory farms where cows or pigs or chickens or other animals are crammed together? And yes, um, they spread infections one to the other and then to the farm hands and to their community. To, to ban those really means, or I have to say to address those, really means to address the product they produce. As long as people are eating meat or consuming dairy or eggs, there are going to be factory farms because that's the only way to get massive amounts of these products out to the public. The step that everyone can take is to stop eating those things. Well, that, that is a good step because, and I heard there was one that, a pig farm that had shut down because of Oh, this. yes. Oh, yes. Just the other day, Smithfield Foods closed its Sioux Falls, South Dakota facility, which was huge. About one in every pork chops consumed in America were, came out of Sioux Falls, Smithfield. And the reason, according to the South Dakota governor, is if you looked at all the people who were infected with coronavirus, more than half of them worked in that exact slaughterhouse. Oh, so, I didn't hear that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Um, and, and, to make, and to make it worse, you, you, I, I can hear what you're thinking. You know, do, do you want to have a pork chop wrapped up by somebody who was infected with COVID-19? Um, to make it worse, they, they closed it down, but then they said, well, actually, we're going to reopen just long enough so that our staff could come in and process the, the product that they have there on site. Not, not a good time to buy pork. Glad I'm plant-based. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> wow. Yeah, really. Okay. Didn't know about that piece. Well, why has the, the media, health professionals, not highlighted the importance of a good diet and exercise as a way to reduce you know, the severity of these symptoms? I think that's, that's, it's an urgent thing. Oh. Everybody is aware that underlying health conditions make the virus much more severe. 
I'm talking about people with hypertension. And, and this, this has been known ever since the Chinese outbreak began. 40% uh, of the people in China who had very serious courses of COVID-19 happened to have hypertension. Diabetes, obesity, and lung diseases, including asthma, including smoking even, all of these things, they don't make it more likely that you'll get the virus, I don't think. What they make it more likely is that you will end up in the ICU or, or die of it. And yeah. the, study, the studies have shown that repeatedly. So the question is, well, why are people not paying attention? They're paying attention to one piece of it. Researchers have wondered, why is it that African-Americans have more courts of COVID-19 if they're infected? And why are mortality figures among African-Americans really much worse? than among other groups. And I have to say, I believe that one of the major reasons for that is going to be the fact that hypertension is much more common and diabetes is much more common and so is obesity among African Americans compared with other groups. There could be other reasons too. It could be that, that urban areas are hit harder than rural areas. It could be that the types of jobs that people are in could, could be the issue. If you're a cashier or something, maybe different than if, you, if you're not interacting with people so much. But the underlying conditions are important. But, but you asked the $64,000 question, why are health professionals not really talking about that very much? And I believe that the reason is they don't feel there's anything they can do about them. That they feel like you got hypertension now. Really? So he, he, I, I think their, their, their attitude is you got the, the virus, you're going to be over it in three, four weeks, maybe, maybe sooner than that. So you're if you live. If you live. So, so your hypertension isn't anything you can deal with. But here's my, here's my reply to that. The vast majority of people who are gonna get this don't have it yet, and the virus is coming to them. And so let's say I have hypertension. If I change my diet and lifestyle, your blood pressure can come down very rapidly. Like um, less than 10 days. An, an interesting statistic came from the DASH study. This study was done more than 20 years ago, 1997. And it was an eight week trial. And it was so instructive. The whole idea was, can you bring your blood pressure down if you got high, high blood pressure? And they happened to observe that people who followed vegetarian diets back in the 90s happened to have fairly low blood pressure. But they also figured that nobody would follow a diet like that. So they said, well, we'll just cut down on meat and we'll greatly increase vegetables and fruits. And we'll call it the DASH diet. And they did. And it was going to be an eight-week trial. But within two weeks, blood pressure <laughs> fell substantially. And, but, and, and, it just, and it just stayed low, you know, week four, week six, week, week eight. So my point is this, if there's a virus out there that you are gonna catch in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, but you had the, 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 the foresight to change your diet and lifestyle now, and you don't have to just cut down on meat, you can throw it out. You can get rid of animal products all together. You can greatly increase vegetables and fruits. This will also help you lose weight, which all of these things help your blood pressure to come down. The virus comes, you still may get infected. I mean, that's what, that's what hand washing is for. The, the, the eating vegetables and fruits is not going to stop the virus, I don't think. But, but your blood pressure is now under control. You may not be hi hypertensive at all. You've removed one of those vulnerabilities. Now, our research team has not only studied hypertension, but diabetes, obesity, and we found that people can improve. Now, for some people, it takes longer. For others, it's, it's shorter. But this, this nihilistic notion that, well, you're just going to have diabetes and nothing you can do about it. Just you're on the railroad tracks. The train is coming. Just good luck to you. That, I think that's irresponsible. I think we really need to say, let's change. And, and there's some things that are just not rocket science at all. It's a respiratory illness. One in seven American adults smokes. One in seven adolescents is vaping. Is it a good idea to maybe not smoke now? Yes. Lung cancer is a long-term risk, but COVID is a short-term risk. But if you quit smoking now, within about six weeks, your lungs are, are dramatically healthier. Vaping is anybody's guess. We really don't know the, the damage that it's doing to the lungs. But for my money, I would say don't be inhaling things. By the way, some people have also looked at marijuana and suggested that it may also be damaging to the lungs in the same way as tobacco. So, but bottom line, people are, are, are doing all kinds of things that are extremely disruptive to their lifestyle. And the old-fashioned idea that nobody will change their diet, it's too much work. Well, look what we're going through now. You know, your job has been shut down. You're not allowed out of your house. How hard is it to just set aside the bacon and eat beans and, and pasta and healthy foods? Yeah, your health is worth working for and yeah. changing and putting it. 
you've got the time. <laughs> There's no excuse now. You get in the kitchen, you know, uh, start cooking. Yeah, I want to shout out to the Medical Society of the District of Columbia, which wrote to the White House Task Force, which is on TV every night. And they said, you need to put on experts in underlying conditions. Like right now, I mean, they, they have some great people like Dr. Fauci and others who are experts in infectious disease, but they don't have anybody on the, on the White House Task Force who's an expert in diabetes or hypertension or even lung diseases. And that needs to change. And, we, and, and, and frankly, three things ought to, to be said. Uh, number one, Americans should, should stop smoking. Number two, if you're on medications for diabetes or lung diseases or hypertension, talk to your primary care doctor now and make sure that your medications are current, fill lapsed prescriptions, treat to target. If you're over-treated or under-treated, it's not good. Get to target. Number three, improve your diet. Get rid of the animal products, bring in the healthy vegetables and fruits and whole and, and healthy whole plant-based foods. See how you do. We, can, th we this, this, None of this takes the place of hand washing and social distancing and wearing a mask. But those things are just there to keep the virus out and, and they fail. And when they fail, then you wanna make sure that your body is as strong as, as you can be. We do not know if these will change the course of the disease, but we have to try. Well, the virus seems to hit the chest pretty hard. I heard you know, people describe it as like taking a shovel and just going bam into your chest. Right. I mean, a lot of mucus is produced in general. What foods can exacerbate the formation of mucus? Well, the, the one that, that people have talked about for a very long time, since long before COVID-19, is dairy. And, and you'll see people who consume dairy and they'll get a little <clears throat> in their throat, a little bit of junk in their throat. Many opera singers will not touch dairy because it just, they have that phlegm and, 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 and pe many people with problems throughout the whole respiratory tree from the sinuses to the larynx and even bronchitis and lung diseases, they, they find that these occur less frequently when they get away from dairy products. Now, I have to say, I don't think the research on this is, is particularly high quality, but there have been a number of studies focusing especially on asthma with somewhat mixed results, but, the, but the, the jury seems to be leaning toward, for some people in particular, dairy really affects their respiratory function and getting away from it really does help them. So I would argue that nobody needs dairy. You're better off without it. And for some people, it is the difference between life and death. Well, it, do people who recover, you know, let's say that you get a really bad case of, of the virus and, you know, you needed ventilator assistance and will they have full lung function when they're done or will there be a, you know, will their lungs be compromised? We hope they will, but there does seem to be scarring in some cases uh, where the lungs, I guess, I guess an analogy would be smoking. A person has smoked for a long period of time and have this hacking cough, uh, they quit smoking. Eventually, their cough goes away, and, and yet, if you did an x-ray of their, their lungs, you can see that the, 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 the tobacco did some damage to it, and I suspect the same is going to be true with COVID-19. The early signs are that some people do have scarring. Wow. I did an interview with Lorraine Sire, and we did an interview with her at one point because her whole family, I mean... Her mom reversed, you know, was going to have had to have a triple bypass. She couldn't do it because her kidneys were having issues and she was diabetic. I mean, and a whole host of issues that the family recovered from. So that now they've been plant based for quite a few years now and they got hit with the, the virus, the whole family. Interesting to note though, that I mean, from young to old. So her grandparents who live right with her and her husband and her two children and herself, they all got the virus. With differing, differing levels, some got with it a little bit harder than the others. The kids seem to have it less. And interesting to note that her mother did not get the virus. And she was living right in the plague of all of them, right front and center, taking care of everybody. And she was O positive in terms of her blood type. The rest of the family was blood type A and everybody else, who, blood type A all got it nailed. Blood type yeah. O didn't get it. Have you seen this? It's an interesting point. I guess a couple things should be said. Um, I don't think people with type O are immune to it. Uh, type O is the most common blood type. 
Uh, type A is much less common. So I think people with type O can, can acquire it. However, an interesting bit of evidence came in from China. There was a large report that got leaked prior to publication that showed exactly what you just said, that people with type A were more likely to, to, to get it and t people with type O were, were less likely to. Or it was either to acquire it or to have a poor course. The type A's did the worst, the type O's did the best. And I have to say, when, when this was leaked, there was this massive reaction, that can't be true, this has got to be nonsense, you know, da 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 it's got to be peer-reviewed, let's, let's, uh, let's hold judgment. There is some reason to think that there could be something to this, and, and here's why. People with blood type A tend to run higher with their cholesterols and to have a, a slightly higher risk of, of cardiovascular disease. People with blood type O have the opposite. They tend to have lower cholesterols, less risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the difference is not huge, but it's there. And it's easy to go too far with this. Back in 1996, the book Eat Right for Your Type came out. Yes. And yes. The, idea, the idea was if you're type A, you should be vegan, but if you're type O, you should eat meat. And I have to say that turned out to be, what's a polite way to say nonsense? And the, the, re the reason being that while it's true that the type A's were at higher risk of, of certain diseases and type O lower risk, there isn't anybody who doesn't do better when they go on to a completely healthy plant-based diet. In our research here, we track blood types in some research studies, and the healthy vegan diet is great for the type A's, but it also turns out to be the best diet for the type O's, <laughs> you know, so, so it's good for everybody. But... In the same way as people with blood type O do tend to run lower cholesterol, one could imagine that they might have a slight layer of protection in a disease where heart disease happens to be one of those underlying risk factors for COVID-19. Wow. Well, I just have to say the whole family recovered and did it quite well. I mean, yeah. with minimal you know, symptoms. I mean, they did have fever, but it went pretty much. I mean, you can watch the interview, but it, wow, I was impressed. And she looked fabulous for having had it. I mean, you know, because I hear it just like knocks you flat on, on your back. So, well, you know, the chances are that she doesn't, hopefully her family didn't have a lot of hypertension, diabetes, lung diseases, the things that really make this a bad disease. Right. And, and by the way, having fever is not in and of itself a terrible thing. That's the, that's the body's sort of crude and pathetic response to a virus. The virus came in. Viruses don't live very well at elevated temperatures. So our bodies came up with this rather crude thing of, I'm going to elevate my body temperature by a couple of degrees and knock out the virus. So ha having a fever is a natural response. Now, it can get out of hand. It can be dangerous in and of itself. But, but having a fever is a sign that your body is responding to the virus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I heard the virus enters through the mouth, the nose, eyes. How come it doesn't go through the ears, which are connected, you know? I mean, like all these systems are connected. Well, because you do have a little tiny thin layer of skin on the inside of your ear that goes over the eardrum. So something that goes in this ear can't go straight through your head out that ear. Um, there, is a little, <laughs> there is a little thin, thin uh, layer over your eardrum. Okay. Um, when, but, but now when people talk about the ears being connected with the sinuses, they're talking about the inner ear and the middle ear. That's from the inside your mouth, you can reach the ear and from out here, you can reach the outer part of the ear, but no, it doesn't go straight through. Doesn't go straight through. No. Good to know. All right. Well, once a person has the COVID-19, can they get it again? I mean, there seems to be massive confusion on this. Well, that's simply because we don't have enough evidence to know. We're, we're hoping not. They're, they're, clearly is a layer of immunity that does occur, but the question is how long does it last? Will, and, and even if it does last, will it confer any immunity over variants that arise? Well, we'll have to stay tuned. All right. Well, people who eat the SAD diet, the, the standard American diet, SAD for short, mm -hmm. versus plant-based, do you think someone who's plant-based will have a better chance? I mean, does this diet make a difference? In recovery time, inflammation, what are we talking? The, the, the diet clearly affects the underlying risk factors. It will affect your blood pressure, it will affect your diabetes, it will affect your waistline, those things all relate. For a person with asthma who goes plant-based, 
chances are their asthma is likely to improve. Maybe not for everybody, but for a lot of people. So a plant-based diet takes away the things that make us especially vulnerable to, to a disaster with COVID-19. So in, in that sense, yes. What we don't know yet is does a, a healthy plant-based diet really ramp up your white blood cells to seek out and destroy that virus before it gets you? There are a lot of theoretical reasons to believe that nutrition is important in immunity, but that whole body of research is still sort of in its infancy and, and is not as robust as it needs to be. There's a lot we do know already, but we, we need to know more. And maybe just to make a couple of quick points, it does look like people who are thinner do have better immune strength than people who are quite overweight, and so a plant-based diet helps there. There's some evidence that reducing dietary fat helps. Your white blood cells are, are soldiers. They can't work in an oil slick. So getting the, the, the oil out of your diet does seem to be helpful, and, and I would add animal fat to that as well. Um, you mean my extra virgin olive oil? <laughs> yeah, I mean pork fat, chicken fat, fish oil, and yes, extra virgin olive oil. I, even if I, it was pressed by virgins on the seventh solstice of the seventh month? Even then. And I have to say, you would, you'd be amazed at some of the research studies that people have done. They have taken white cells, white blood cells in the test tube and looked at how they behave when you add fat. They have fed fatty diets to people and looked at their white blood cells action. They have dripped fat into their veins. And all of these things seem to make white blood cells not work as well. Well, do the high inflammation markers correlate to the cytokine storms and or death with, with COVID-19? Well, yes. And so people know what we're talking about. The virus comes in your body and it's attacking you. And then in response, your body develops an inflammatory response, which is your body's way of saying, there's an invader here. My uh, white blood cells are going to find him, attack him, engulf him, get rid of him. Unfortunately, in many cases, our body's reaction is worse than, than just the, the entrance of the virus to it. Your white blood cells produce what are called cytokines. These are inflammatory intermediaries that can create havoc in your body. And so your lungs are weeping out fluid, trying to flush away this virus and effectively drowning you. I mean, there's a lot that can happen as, as a result of the body's overwhelming response. Well, who are going to be some people who are going to naturally just have these high inflammation markers? Oh, okay. Well, if you do a randomized clinical trial, and frankly, your average American it often has high inflammatory markers, um, just as things like C-reactive protein and, and, it's, and other, other indicators of excessive chronic inflammation. Right. When you take away from a person's diet dairy products and eggs and meat, you're taking away the, the uh, mammalian proteins and the avian proteins and so forth. And the body has less to respond to. For, for whatever reason, when people begin a completely plant-based diet, these markers improve and they improve quite a lot. Now, that said, this has been looked at with regard to autoimmune conditions and others. Nobody yet knows what this means for COVID-19. We're just going based on the best evidence that we have. Okay. Well, what should we be focused on? to stay healthy? Well, you want to focus on a healthy diet, needless to say, and that means four food groups, vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans. When I say beans, I'm going to include their cousins like lentils and peas. And what do those foods do for you? First of all, they don't have very much fat in them. They have just the trace that you need. So that's good. They don't have any cholesterol, so your heart is happy, but they are also rich in antioxidants and uh, rich in vitamins, some of which appear to be helpful. Obviously, as we've discussed before, you do need to take vitamin B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood. So that basically is a healthy diet. I do a few other things. I do think it's good to rest. This, I know this sounds sort of like grandpa's advice, you know, go lie down, go rest. But I think it's really true. When your body is fighting anything, when it's trying to heal, you really need to give it, to, to take away the competing tasks that it has to do. So, and, and this, frankly, I, I can't prove this. My suspicion is even if a person is just staying awake studying for school, 
till 1.30 at night, and they're not really physically active. But if they're missing sleep, my guess is that their recovery is not going to be as good as a person who just lies down and goes to sleep at 9.30 and sleeps through the night, or frankly, sleep as much as you want when, when you're dealing with, with an illness like this. I, I think your recovery is going to be better. Now, having said that, despite the fact that in many communities we're on lockdown, you're not supposed to go out except for essential reasons, I have to say if there is a way for you to go into a park or into the woods and go for a nice good walk, assuming that you're up for it, yes, six feet apart and all that kind of stuff, but there's something to be said for getting out in the fresh air and letting your lungs expand and breathe. Right. And I think when people just sit home and they're enclosed in their little box, that's not as good. Right. Well, what about like caffeine, alcohol, things like that? Yeah, uh, frankly, I think we're, we're better off avoiding those things. Those things can, can affect our immunity and, and so forth. And, and we said at the beginning, and, and Gene, I know none of your viewers smoke, but if they have a loved one who does, this is the perfect time to quit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do we have to worry about our fruits and vegetables being contaminated and over the next few months? Um, yes, I, th I, think, I, I, I think so. Uh, but, but worried uh, or attentive doesn't mean panicking. Fruits and vegetables are healthy. They're the healthiest things in the store. But I have to say, you do kind of wish that people wouldn't pick up this apple, I set know. it down, pick up this apple, set <laughs> like 23 I'm apples guilty. later. Yeah, I, you know, we, we, we've all been there. We've all been there. But I think now is the time to sort of minimize our touch. And then, and then when we get home, you do have to wash them. You don't have to go crazy with it. The, the mechanical force of the water alone will dislodge stuff that's on there. But with a, a little mild soap is, is not a bad idea. Refrigerating does not kill viruses. Um, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, oh. the, yeah, no, viruses can live very happily in the fridge. <laughs> um, but clean, clean them, clean your apples and, and so forth and, and, and leave it at that. I wouldn't worry too much mm -hmm. beyond that. If you're concerned about the availability of these things, Sure, to the extent that farm workers are being attacked by it, yeah, uh, we may run out of things. I hope we don't. Are there any specific foods, supplements, behaviors that we should be doing besides, okay, we get it sleep, exercise, eating yeah. food based? What else? Everything's under research, but, but a few things are sort of rising to the top. The first thing is it's been in folklore for a long time, and that's garlic. And I have to say, I've been a huge garlic skeptic. I thought the only reason you're pushing garlic is because you like garlic. And, there's, well, and, and, and yeah. let's, let's face it, I mean, it goes pretty well on garlic bread and on pasta and all kinds oh, of things. Oh, yeah. But I, but I have to say, and, and I guess the other reason for being skeptical is some of the studies that you'll read are, are funded by some source that's got an economic investment in it. But, but with those caveats aside, there was a, quite a good study that looked at a large group of adults right in the middle of cold season. And they were looking at the cold virus, not the, not COVID virus, but it's a virus. And what they showed was, or what they did in this study was they took uh, capsules, identical capsules. Some were just dummy pills, placebos. Others had what's called allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. That's the active ingredient in garlic. And so you got one or the other. The people who got the garlic pills had a dramatic reduction in their likelihood of developing colds. And when you looked at just the number of sick days, it was cut by maybe two thirds. Um, so I thought, okay, garlic bread tonight. So we, we, we need more research, but what we have is showing it to be certainly safe and it may be effective. Vitamin C became famous because of the work of Linus Pauling, who won not one, but two Nobel Prizes. And in his later years, he was actually taking as much as 18 grams of vitamin C per day. What? Yes. Don't try this at home. That, that is oh. a huge amount. But nonetheless, there is some evidence that vitamin C can help uh, with respiratory viruses. I think the research, in my view, is far from perfect. But I do think there are some glimmers of, of value coming through. With regard to vitamin D, vitamin D normally comes from sunlight on your skin. And if you're in a place where you're not getting regular sunlight, then taking a supplement can be helpful. But there is evidence that vitamin D also can be helpful with regard to respiratory illnesses. With regard to zinc, zinc was popularized by a company that makes a product called Cold And you'll see it in every drugstore in the cold remedy aisle. 
And what they will say is you can get a cold, it won't stop that, but it will shorten the duration. And that seems to be true. So why would that be? Well, it probably is doing something to boost your immune defenses. So you, you can still get the, vi the cold virus, but you can repel it sooner. So those are a few things that I think are worth knowing about. Okay. Well, is it better to get it from supplements or from your, what you're eating? Okay. Uh, with regard to vitamin C, in either way, it's probably, either way it's going to work. Vitamin C's most natural source, of course, is uh, not just the citrus vegetable, uh, citrus fruits, but also vegetables like broccoli. It's got vitamin C in it. However, the amounts that Linus Pauling was promoting, you to get to 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 milligrams a day, it's got to be a supplement probably. Vitamin D, natural source is the sun. So you should all win the lottery and go live in a lovely equatorial spot. Failing that, if you're either in a place that does not get much sun or you're using sunscreen all the time, then a supplement will work for you. 2,000 international units a day is the normal dose that people recommend. Okay. Well, a, a listener, because I threw out all these questions, a lot of these are coming from listeners. And so one of them asked, will coconut water work since it's antiviral? I have to say, I don't know, but I'm very skeptical about it only because I have to say the economic promotion of coconut products has been embarrassing. People, right? are, pushing it, people are pushing it. You know, one day coconut is going to do your taxes for you. It does every wonderful thing. And the coconut oil will raise your cholesterol just, oh. just as we feared it would. Yeah. Um, and so coconut products, in my view, it's very hard to separate the science from the promotion. And, and in this case, I would not count on it having any immune effect. So masks, I got to change <laughs> topics. So I started, you know, I didn't have any masks. And you can't find them, like any place, for love or money. So I started making, I made two, and actually made a video on how to make them without sewing. <laughs> you know, like the, the, the easy way, like, you know, taking paper towels. I did it with that, and I did it with my husband's handkerchiefs. And I'm just gonna share a story with you. I'm out in the garage and I have my hot tub out in the garage. So it's a portable one. So I'm sitting in my hot tub and I'm sitting there looking up and it's a multi-purpose room, my garage. It's got the refrigerator, it's got the pegboard, the workbench. And I'm sitting there in my hot tub and I'm looking up and I just happen to catch my eye. And sitting on the shelf on my pegboard is guess what? <laughs> Masks <laughs> from when we did the, you know, when we refurbished the house and they are N95, so. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that too loud. Put those in the safe. I know. My husband, I gave one to my husband. I said, make sure you don't put that, like, on, leave it on the seat. Right. You know, because somebody will break in to get that. They, they will. They will. Yeah. <laughs> but if you can't get any now, what? how good is, like, a handkerchief, paper towels? I mean. Yes, well, hopefully we won't need these much longer. The best explanation that I've heard for this is trying to make the point that the, the point of a mask is to protect people from you, not so much to protect you from other people. In, in other words, if you're, let's say you're coughing, sneezing, or even talking, that's a little bit like, like a fire hose coming out of your, your mouth. If you have a mask in front of it, then that's gonna stop some of those respiratory droplets that could otherwise convey the virus. On the other hand, if let's say you're in a crowded e an elevator and there are all kinds of people breathing and sneezing and coughing, that mask is going to probably not be dramatically effective at stopping you from picking up a potential virus. It's, it's still advisable to wear, but I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that the purpose of a mask is more to protect people from you than to protect you from other people. Okay. Well, what about anti-inflammatory medications causing complications for those who get the virus? What are your thoughts on that? Stay tuned. We have to learn more about them. Um, but where this really comes in is a person's got a, a, a fever and they're achy. And so they'll take 200 milligrams of ibuprofen or 400 or 600 or you name it, and they will feel better and their, their fever will come down. But you then have the concern that didn't I just disable my body's natural response to the virus, which is the fever, and wouldn't it be better to just leave the the fever alone, let it go as long as it doesn't get too high. That has some logic to it, but a person cannot, you can't allow a, a fever to get too high. And, and also when people feel so super achy, it's understandable that they would want to take some of these things. But anyway, well, I, that's, that's the type of war that we're dealing with. 
Well, I had heard that if you take like ibuprofen, that it exacerbates it and you end up having more respiratory issues. Have you heard that too? Well, well, that, that's our concern is that the, 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 what it's doing is it's stopping your, your own body's response to the virus. Right. And in some cases you want to allow your body to respond. To it, you know. In fact, this is the point of inflammation in general. Inflammation is the body's crude way of attacking right. a foreign invader, and sometimes uh, inflammation hurts us. Um, it creates all kinds of symptoms of it in and of its own. But ibuprofen or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs work by stopping your body's defenses, and okay. so so it's a double-edged sword. All right. Here's the million-dollar question, Neil. Here it is, coming at you. Ready? Here's the Okay, video. I'm ready. How soon is this going to be over? And what's it going to look like going forward? Are we going to ever be safe? And is there more waves coming? When it's going to be over, we don't know. But summertime will look much different from where we are now. Not much question about that. We have to presume that this wave is going to be tailing down by mid to late summer uh, a lot. However... The, first of all, life will never get back to normal. This, once this virus has entered the human population, so far as I can see, it's never going to leave. So the concern that we have, and I hope I'm wrong with this, but the concern I have is that it will become like influenza, which once it entered the human population, we have just lived with it for the past century, and it picks off people every single year in COVID-19, and its progeny will probably be the same. What we can hope for, though, is number one, we will acquire some herd immunity where we are stronger because we've encountered this virus. And hopefully enough of us will acquire that immunity that they will protect the others. We will hope that as a population, we will realize that selling animals means that you're also trading in all of the pathogens the animals are carrying. And that perhaps we will find a a way to distance ourselves from that kind of trade. I mean, shutting down the wet markets. And, and frankly, we should simply be going to plant-based diets, generally speaking. You don't want to survive COVID-19 to die of a heart attack or diabetes complications. The same diet changes that affect all those more chronic conditions can also protect us against the short-term infections. That's true. Absolutely true. Okay. Here's your question. What are five essential, you know, grabs, grocery store grabs for you during the pandemic? What, you know, five things. Okay. Okay. Well, you want to do a couple things. You want to make sure things are healthy, yeah. but also that they are shelf stable in case you're stuck in your apartment for the next three months. And some people have been getting things like spam and, um, you know, <laughs> chicken. <laughs> I'm not kidding because they know they are shelf stable. I mean, it already... It probably sat on the shelf for six years before you bought it, so it's going to last enough. <laughs> We're kidding. Okay, so it's it is okay to get canned things, but get some get something that where what is in the can is good. So instead of spam, get something like uh, canned beans, and you can have canned beans. They last for a really long time. If you have canned chickpeas, you can turn them into hummus. You have canned black beans, pinto beans, fine. Or you can actually get the dried beans. And I personally get both. I get canned beans if I'm in a real hurry, dried beans if I've got a little time to let them soak overnight. But uh, black beans, pinto beans, um, chickpeas, they're all terrific. And they last, in, when they're dried, they last a really, really long time. Same with grains. Uh, for me, something like rice, quinoa, they don't last forever. Um, the tiny traces of fat that's in the bran coating of the rice can eventually get rancid. But it takes a long time to get there. So stocking up on, on beans and, and lentils and their cousins, good, good. rice and its cousins, uh, like quinoa, terrific. When it comes to vegetables, I personally don't normally get canned vegetables because the, the nutritional quality is a little bit better if they're frozen or if they're fresh. Fresh doesn't have a sh super long shelf life, but that's why people aren't buying them now. If you go into the grocery store, people are stocking up on the shelf stable, sh shelf stable things they're avoiding the broccoli and, and Swiss chard and kale and so forth. I know. I'm fully stocked around here. I'm stocking up on all of those. So you can eat those from day to day on your weekly trip to the, to the grocery store. But if you want to stock up, on, stock up on canned vegetables and canned fruits and so forth, you, you can. They're okay. 
If you get uh, frozen broccoli and Brussels sprouts and so forth, frankly, you have to fight through uh, the crowds to get there first thing in the morning to find any of these days. But if you have them, they're going to be stable in your freezer for at least a few weeks. Eventually, they're going to get sort of dehydrated and not be so good. Um, do take some vitamin B12. You need that for healthy right. nerves and health, healthy blood. It's obviously shelf stable. So those are right. some of the things that are my personal favorites. One other thing, let me mention tofu or tempeh. We think of those as being not very shelf stable, but when you pick it up, look at the date on it. And the date is like a couple of months from now, assuming you got one that was fairly recently put on the shelf. So it'll last a good long while and it's, um, these are very versatile products. Yep, absolutely. Okay. We've heard it. Stay home. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wear a mask. Got it. Okay. But what are five things I can do right now to make a difference? Okay. Um, number one, you do want to eat in a healthy way. So we, we talked about that. That means a healthy vegan diet, plant-based diet. But add to that, keep the oils really low. I mentioned earlier that, that keeping oils low is going to help your immune system. And that applies not just to animal fats, but, but to even the most expensive oils that you can find in the store. So that's a really good thing to do. I do think that it's useful to not just avoid bad stuff, but bring good stuff in. When I say good things, I mean fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. Incorporate them in your routine, and hopefully that habit will persist well beyond this current pandemic. I mentioned earlier about getting a good night's sleep. My rule of thumb is 10 o'clock. No matter how good the podcast is that I'm listening to, no matter how good the book I have is or the TV show or whatever, when the clock strikes 10, the light goes off. And even oh, if you... <laughs> oh, oh. And you start yawning. You start yawning. I hope you do. And if you don't, make, uh, make yourself yawn. And then you will find yourself dozing off to a lovely sleep. And even if you wake up early the next morning, you'll find that you're, you're feeling better. This is a good time to get away from things that get you into a bad rut. When I say a bad rut, I mean the mixed drink with dinner. And for some people, it becomes their way of, call, of uh, powering down every single day. And if it's one drink and two drinks, it, it can put you in a bad spot and it can also disrupt your sleep. What? How can alcohol disrupt my, disrupt my sleep? Because the alcohol molecule transforms in the liver to something called aldehydes and acetaldehyde is a stimulant. So your sleep gets very rocky and light. Caffeine can do that too. Uh, everyone's a little bit different, but for many people, there are traces of their morning cup of coffee still in their bloodstream when they're trying to go to bed. So be careful about those things. Um, do get some exercise. If you have to do it in your apartment, fair enough. Even better if you could sneak out and get into the sunshine. Um, that's good for your uh, mood. It's good for your lungs and your heart, but it's also good for your sleep. If your muscles aren't tired, you just don't sleep as soundly. But if you gave your muscles a good workout, they demand sleep. So I'm not sure if that's five things or not, but that, it's somewhere around there. Well, that's good. I just want to throw in, you know, take the time to learn how to cook. You mm -hmm. know, you've got all this. Make your home your wellness center. And because if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. I mean, I don't know about you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I can hear like ice cream calling me like, you know, blocks away. So I just don't bring it into the house. So yes. Oh, you, you said it. Don't bring it into your house because if you bring it in, into your house, it will end up in your esophagus. It will. It's not a right. question of if, but when. So, you know, so I just don't bring it in. I make my house my wellness center and we've kind of turned the basement in because we're not going to the gym that we used to go to because it's shut down. <laughs> I'm in right. the heart of it up here in, in New York. So we don't go to the gym anymore. So what we did is we bought this, it's called a gazelle strider. And it's, you know, cause some of these machines can be extraordinarily expensive, but this was quite reasonable. I think it was like three, three, over $300. And it's very sturdy and it has the same motion as cross country skiing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it's no, no stress on your knees, you know, and it gives you a real good cardio workout and you can change the levels on it and watch your heart and all that good stuff. So that, and we have a little trampoline, you know, the little rebounders. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. another one that gets, gets my blood pumping. And I just turn the music on and me and Bruce Springsteen, we go down and dance <laughs> in the dark. Okay. So it's good. But getting that in there, there's also one of my favorite websites. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's called Do Yoga With Me. Mm. So the majority of it is free. 
And you can search by classes. For example, they have all different types of instructors, all different types of yoga. They have it from anywhere from, you know, if you, know, if you have like only 20 minutes to do it, you know, whatever. They have time, you know, if you want to do it for longer. They also, you can sort it by levels from, you know, basic, intermediate, advanced. So, and then by teachers. So uh, amazing website. Majority of it is free. I like free. And so you can just mm -hmm. do that and get your yoga mat out and, you know, zen out. And so... Another thing I want to just point out to you is to make a schedule because if you have a schedule through the day, make sure you schedule your exercise because if you schedule it just like anything else, it's going to happen, you know? And sometimes like I will make sure I, you know, get my phone out and I'll call my girlfriend and we'll start, you know, as I'm right. exercising, she's exercising, we're doing it together. We schedule it so that we keep each other accountable. So yeah. that's also a good thing too. So if you can schedule it with somebody else, you know, <laughs> through social media, you know, kind of thing, Zooms or whatever, go for it, you know. But, That's right. That's so good because if you miss, they will know. So, yes. Yeah. If, it, if it's just you, 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 people are a little yeah. too forgiving sometimes. Right. So if you can schedule it with somebody and say, let's do it together, and you're on the phone together doing this, breathing heavy, you know, it, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing. Well, Dr. Barnard, as always, your words of wisdom are amazing. And thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Well, it's been a real pleasure. These are, these are tough times, uh, but we're learning a lot as we go through it and, and uh, hopefully we'll do as well as humanly possible. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you.